Item number, SCP-008, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-008 samples have been deemed Class V Extreme Biological Hazards, and all related protocols apply. Incineration and irradiation measures will be deployed in the event of political or military action, which may result in the facility being dismantled, a power failure or zero communications from operatives or outside channels during any given eight-hour period. The quarantine period for operatives leaving the facility is four months. If a breach has occurred, incineration and irradiation measures shall be deployed. It should be the policy of all G2 sites to not prepare an evacuation procedure. Description SCP-008 is a complex prion, samples of which are stored in each of the known G2 sites. Research into SCP-008 is highly classified, and primarily aimed at preventing research which may lead to the synthesis of SCP-008 in the distant future. Traits of the SCP-008 prion include 100% infectiousness, 100% lethality, transmission through exposed mucous membranes and all bodily fluids, not airborne or waterborne. Symptoms of infection with SCP-008 manifest no more than three hours after exposure and include flu-like symptoms with high fever plus severe dementia in later stages, coma onset approximately 20 hours after first symptoms appear and 12 hours after noticeable dementia, coma onset will be considered onset of death, a period of sporadic cellular necrosis occurs which comes to resemble gangrene. Surviving tissue assumes its original function and is highly resilient. Red blood cells greatly increase oxygen storage capacity, resulting in slower blood flow and increased muscle endurance and strength. Nervous and muscular systems are unaffected by total organ failure for several hours. Metabolism may decrease to extremely low levels, allowing subject to survive for over 10 years without nutrition. High blood viscosity results in negligible blood flow from gunshot, puncture, and slashing injuries. Conditioned behavior, motor controls, and instinctive behavioral mechanisms are damaged, and cognitive abilities are severely retarded and erratic. Animals experience excessive brain necrosis and are inactive. Subject can adapt to its damaged nervous systems but is limited to basic physical activities, including standing up, balancing on two legs, walking, biting grabbing, and crawling. Subject will energetically move towards sights, sounds, and smells it associates with living humans. Subject will attempt to ingest living humans if physical contact is made. Neutralizing fully infected subjects requires significant cranial trauma. There is strong evidence to suggest SCP-008 itself did not form naturally on Earth, since variants of similar complexity would have displaced much of the ecosystem. In 1959, a short collaborative effort with the USSR to locate G2 sites and eliminate SCP-008 was negotiated following their discovery. The status of SCP-008 in Russian custody since collaboration ended is unknown. Addendum 008-1, SCP-500 has been found to be able to completely cure SCP-008, even in the advanced stages of the disease. Item number. SCP-022 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures A vault door has been installed following Incident 022-827 to seal SCP-022. It is to remain locked at all times, with the sole exception being the appearance of an instance of SCP-022-1. The original door to SCP-022 was destroyed during Incident 022-827, with attempts at replacement being met with failure. Security cameras have been installed to monitor for instances of SCP-022-1. In the event that an instance of SCP-022-1 appears, automated systems should incinerate it the moment it leaves SCP-022. At this point, the vault door may be unlocked to admit cleanup crews. Should the automated systems fail to destroy the instance of SCP-022-1, response teams are cleared to enter and neutralize it. 
Under no circumstances may any living human enter SCP-022, except at the order of Class 4 personnel for testing purposes. Class 4 personnel may also order instances of SCP-022-1 to be captured and held. However, they may not be removed from SCP-022 containment facilities. Description SCP-022 is a morgue in the basement of Hospital in Great Britain. Until 1980, there were no reported anomalous occurrences within the morgue. Reports of strange activity were first received in November of 1980. The area was soon quarantined by the Foundation, with an official story being released that the entire building had been condemned. The reason for the sudden manifestation of its strange properties remains under investigation. Periodically, a random drawer within the morgue will open to reveal a cadaver under a covered sheet. After approximately six minutes open, the cadaver will animate and attempt to leave the morgue. At this point, the cadaver is given the designation SCP-022-1. In some cases, the cadaver will be too damaged or decomposed to successfully exit SCP-022 or even rise from the table it lies on. In this case, SCP-022-1 will typically struggle and twitch on the table until expiration occurs. Should an instance of SCP-022-1 expire while remaining on the table, the table slides back into the drawer, which then shuts. Reports indicate that the scent of burnt tissue is evident immediately following such an event. The energy source that sustains instances of SCP-022-1 is currently unknown. Instances do not breathe, eat, or sleep, and their bodies produce no heat. Analysis of SCP-022-1 following expiration has discovered no abnormal organs or chemicals present. They appear to be fully human cadavers. Instances also possess physical strength that exceeds that of normal humans. Though direct testing has proven problematic, researchers estimate the strength increase to be approximately 500 newtons, 112 pounds, of lifting force greater than what one would expect of a human body sharing a similar condition. Analysis is underway to determine if this effect is connected to the unknown power source, or if it is an entirely separate phenomenon. When body parts are severed from SCP-022-1, the portion with the greatest mass retains its effects. All other pieces become inert. Destruction of the head or brain does not neutralize SCP-022-1. Instead, the lower torso and limbs remain animate. Complete tissue destruction appears to be the only method of successfully terminating instances of SCP-022-1. Left alone, instances of SCP-022-1 will simply expire. All motion ceases, and they appear to become normal cadavers again. The amount of time this takes depends on how damaged the body is and the rate of decomposition, and can take anywhere between two days and three weeks. Investigation has revealed that the bodies acting as SCP-022-1 match the description of cadavers reported to have been stolen from morgues across the country. The mechanism for this transfer is currently being researched. Adding any new matter to SCP-022 has thus far proved impossible. Any object that enters SCP-022 disappears shortly after passing through the door, leaving no trace. This includes inanimate objects and biological specimens. So long as an instance of SCP-022-1 possesses a functioning mouth, tongue, and trachea, it is able to communicate fully with researchers. See the following interview log for details. Interview Log 022-751 Each of the following interviews begin in much the same way. The instance of SCP-022-1 will typically be hysterical until Foundation personnel are able to calm or restrain them. These portions have been omitted. Date, March, 1980. Interviewee, SCP-022-1-2. Interviewer, Dr. Notes, SCP-022-1-2 was the second instance of SCP-022-1 that the Foundation discovered, the first having been destroyed on site by Foundation agents. SCP-022-1-2 had the body of an Asian male, approximately 54 years old. Its chest had been stitched up, evidence of an autopsy. Begin log. Doctor, please identify yourself. SCP-022-1-2. 
My... My name is John... What... What the hell is going on? Doctor, that's what we're trying to figure out, John. How did you get to this... state? SCP-022-1-2. I... I don't know. I was driving my car. Coming home from... Never mind. I was driving, and I crashed. Doctor, then what happened? SCP-022-1-2. Nothing. I woke up here. Please. This has to be unintelligible. Doctor, so you remember being in a car accident, then woke up here in the morgue. Do you have any idea how you got here? SCP-022-1-2. I didn't get here. Don't you get it? This isn't me. I'm not me. Doctor, what do you mean, you aren't you? At this point, SCP-022-1-2 became severely agitated and had to be physically restrained. This required six agents, due to the strength increase associated with instances of SCP-022-1. Eventually, SCP-022-1-2 was calmed, and the interview proceeded. Doctor, now, would you please explain what you meant? SCP-022-1-2, this is not me. I saw my reflection in the steel. I'm not some old Asian f This isn't me! And log. Following the last statement, SCP-022-1-2 began to smash its head against the wall. Once further restrained, it began to scream unintelligibly for several hours before falling silent. It continued to struggle, though apparently unable to speak, for an additional six days until it finally ceased motion. During this time, it continued decomposing at a natural rate. An examination of the body following this interview was unable to determine a cause of death, as many of the internal organs had been removed. The only injury that did not appear to be a result of a previous surgery or autopsy was a damaged trachea. Date, March. 1980. Interviewee, SCP-022-1-5. Interviewer, Dr. Notes. SCP-022-1-5, animated shortly after D-5619 was sent into SCP-022, and subsequently disappeared. SCP-022-1-5 had the body of an approximately 12-year-old female, missing its right arm and a large portion of its torso. Following the incident with SCP-022-1-3, all instances of SCP-022-1 are physically restrained, before being introduced to valuable personnel, with SCP-022-1-5 being no exception. Begin log. Doctor, please state your name. SCP-022-1-5. What did you bastards do to me? Doctor, please state your name. SCP-022-1-5. What the f*** did you do to me? Doctor, we have done nothing to you. Now please state your name. SCP-022-1-5, you know who I f am. Doctor, refresh my memory then, please. SCP-022-1-5, I'm the guinea pig you just f***ed up. Don't tell me you forgot me, Dr. A- Doctor, are you D-5619? SCP-022-1-5, in the flesh. And for your information, jackass, my name is Now change me back, you son of a bitch. Change me back. End log. At this point, Dr. asked SCP-022-1-5 several questions to verify its identity. Though its identity was confirmed to be that of D-5619, no further useful information was gained from SCP-022-1-5. It was kept in a holding cell until expiring two days later. After three weeks, the body of D-5619 animated as SCP-022-1-7. In a brief interview with SCP-022-1-7, it claimed to be an 89-year-old female. Addendum 022-001. A request has been submitted to create a new entrance to SCP-022 by removing a portion of the south wall. Request pending approval. Addendum 022-002 
A pile of matter was discovered on the floor of the room directly above SCP-022. It appeared to contain all matter that had been sent into SCP-022, with the exception of humans. All materials appeared broken and worn down. Metallic components were covered in large amounts of rust, with all biological parts being in various stages of decomposition. Testing revealed that the time between inserting an object into SCP-022 and it reappearing above to be precisely 183 seconds. Humans who enter, however, do not appear in said pile. Instead, humans appear to become integrated into the morgue, and may later animate as instances of SCP-022-1. Item Number SCP-049 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-049 is contained within a standard secure humanoid containment cell in Research Sector 02 at Site-19. SCP-049 must be sedated before any attempts to transport it. During transport, SCP-049 must be secured within a Class 3 humanoid restriction harness, including a locking collar and extension restraints, and monitored by no fewer than two armed guards. While SCP-049 is generally cooperative with most Foundation personnel, outbursts or sudden changes in behavior are to be met with elevated force. Under no circumstances should any personnel come into direct contact with SCP-049 during these outbursts. In the event SCP-049 becomes aggressive, the application of lavender has been shown to produce a calming effect on the entity. Once calmed, SCP-049 generally becomes compliant and will return to containment with little resistance. In order to facilitate the ongoing containment of SCP-049, the entity is to be provided with the corpse of a recently deceased animal, typically a bovine or other large mammal, once every two weeks for study. Corpses that become instances of SCP-049-2 are to be removed from SCP-049's containment cell and incinerated. SCP-049 is no longer permitted to interact with human subjects and requests for human subjects are to be denied. Temporary Containment Procedure Update Per Containment Committee Order 049.S19.17.1, SCP-049 is no longer permitted to interact directly with any members of Foundation staff, nor is it to be provided with any additional corpses to be used in its surgeries. This order shall persist indefinitely until such time a consensus regarding the ongoing containment of SCP-049 can be reached. Description SCP-049 is a humanoid entity, roughly 1.9 meters in height, which bears the appearance of a medieval plague doctor. While SCP-049 appears to be wearing the thick robes and the ceramic mask indicative of that profession, the garments instead seem to have grown out of SCP-049's body over time. The robes and gloves are identical to a thick hide, built up on the skin, while the mask is composed of a kind of chitin growing out of the bones of the face, and are now nearly indistinguishable from whatever form is beneath them. X-rays indicate that despite this, SCP-049 does have a humanoid skeletal structure beneath its outer layer. SCP-049 is capable of speech in a variety of languages, though it tends to prefer English or medieval French. The entity claims to have originated in 15th century France, though admits that it is particularly well-traveled. While SCP-049 is generally cordial and cooperative with Foundation staff, it can become especially irritated, or at times, outright aggressive, if it feels that it is in the presence of what it calls the Pestilence. Although the exact nature of this Pestilence is currently unknown to Foundation researchers, it does seem to be an issue of immense concern to SCP-049. SCP-049 will become hostile with individuals it sees as being affected by the Pestilence, often having to be restrained should it encounter such. If left unchecked, SCP-049 will generally attempt to kill any such individual. SCP-049 is capable of causing all biological functions of an organism to cease through direct skin contact. How this occurs is currently unknown, and autopsies of SCP-049's victims have invariably been inconclusive. 
SCP-049 has expressed frustration or remorse after these killings, indicating that they have done little to kill the pestilence, though we'll usually seek to then perform a crude surgery on the corpse using the implements contained within a black doctor's bag it carries on its person at all times. The space within this bag is seemingly anomalously large, as SCP-049 has been observed pulling objects larger than the bag itself from within it in order to operate on deceased subjects. While these surgeries are not always successful, they often result in the creation of instances of SCP-049-2. SCP-049-2 instances are reanimated corpses that have been operated on by SCP-049. These instances do not seem to retain any of their prior memories or mental functions, having only basic motor skills and response mechanisms. While these instances are generally inactive, moving very little and in a generally ambulatory fashion, they can become extremely aggressive if provoked, or if directed to by SCP-049. SCP-049-2 instances express active biological functions, though these are vastly different from currently understood human physiology. Despite these alterations, SCP-049 often remarks that these subjects have been cured. Addendum 049.1 Discovery SCP-049 was discovered during the investigation of a series of unknown disappearances in the town of Montauban in southern France. During a raid on a local home, investigators found several instances of SCP-049-2, as well as SCP-049. While law enforcement personnel engaged the hostile 049-2 instances, SCP-049 was noted as watching the engagement and taking notes in its journal. After all of the 049-2 instances were dispatched, SCP-049 willingly entered Foundation custody. SCP-049 Upon Discovery The following interview was conducted by Dr. Raymond Hamm during the initial investigation. Interviewer Dr. Raymond Hamm Site 85 Interviewee SCP-049 Begin Log Alors, comment nous devrions donc commencer une introduction? Is that... is that French? Can we get a translator? The King's English. No need for translation, sir. I can speak it well enough. Good. My name is Dr. Raymond Ham, and I... Ah, uh, a doctor. A like-minded individual, no doubt. Wherein is your speciality, sir? Cryptobiology. Why? <laughs> A medical man such as myself. Wonders abound. And here, I worried I had been abducted by common street thugs. This place, then, this is your laboratory. I had wondered, as clean as it is, and with such little trace of the pestilence here. The pestilence? What do you mean? The scourge. The great dying. Come now. You know the... What is it they call it? The... The... Yeah. Ah, no matter. The pestilence, yes. It abounds outside these walls, you know. So many have succumbed, and many more will continue to, until such time as a perfect cure can be developed. Fortunately, I am very close. It is my duty in life to rid the world of it, you see. The cure, to end all cures. When you say the great dying, are you talking about the bubonic plague? I don't know what that is. Uh, I see. Right, well, the entities our agents encountered at the house, uh, they were dead when you encountered them. Yes, you reanimated them. Mm -hmm. In a manner of speaking, you see things too simply, Doctor. Expand your horizons. Life and death, sickness and health, these are amateur terms for amateur physicians. There is only one ailment that exists in the world of men, and that is the pestilence, and nothing else. Make no mistake, they were very ill. All of them. You think you cured those people? Indeed. My cure is most effective. The things we recovered were not human. 
Yes, well, it is not a perfect cure, but that will come with time and further experimentation. I have spent a lifetime developing my methods, Dr. Ham, and will spend a lifetime more if necessary. Now, we have wasted too much time. There is work to do. I will require a laboratory of my own, one where I can continue my research unimpeded. And assistance, of course, though I can provide those on my own in time. <laughs> oh, I don't think our organization would be willing to- Nonsense. We are all men of science. Fetch your coat and show me to my quarters, Doctor. Our work begins now. End log. Interviewer's note. While SCP-049 is capable of communicating in a very human way, there is a strange sense of unease that one experiences when in its presence. Make no mistake, there is something very uncanny about this entity indeed. Additionally, we've confiscated that pointed stick that SCP-049 keeps waving around. Part of this was due to standard confiscation protocols for the possessions of anomalies. In part, because 049 really is a menace swinging it around like he does. The entity was displeased at first, but after we made some concessions in providing it with test subjects, which are admittedly more for the benefit of our own research, it warmed up to the idea. Addendum 049.2 Observation Log While in containment at Site-19, SCP-049 has spent a considerable amount of time studying and performing surgery on the various mammalian corpses it has been provided. SCP-049 will routinely spend several days performing surgery, and then, regardless of whether or not the corpse becomes an instance of SCP-049-2, spending several more days documenting its findings in a thick leather journal stored within its doctor's bag. SCP-049 will often seek to share its findings with members of Foundation staff. Notably, SCP-049's journals are not written in any known language, and attempts by linguists and codebreakers to decipher them have been unsuccessful. The following is a log of several occasions during which SCP-049 was observed operating on a mammalian corpse. Observational Log 049.ol.1 Summary Subject SCP-049 Preface A test subject D-85123 was introduced into SCP-049's containment cell. The entity expressed sincere gratitude towards all members of the containment and research staff. Observation Notes SCP-049 began by asking D-85123 several standard medical questions as it began removing tools from its bag. Shortly after finishing its preparations, SCP-049 quickly closed the distance between the two, killing the subject with a touch to its throat. Afterwards, SCP-049 made a number of considerable alterations to the basic structure of the subject's corpse, often introducing fluids from within its bag into the subject by way of a hand-powered pump and copper tubing. The resulting 049-2 instance became animated flailing and grasping at the walls of the chamber with a number of manufactured limbs, while moaning out of an oblong orifice now present in its sternum. During this time, SCP-049 was observed taking notes of the instance in its journal, and remarking to the watching research staff about the efficacy of its cure. Security personnel entered the chamber to move SCP-049 back to containment, and were attacked by the instance. The security team dispatched the 049-2 instance, and SCP-049 returned to containment with no resistance, stating that it was pleased with the results. Observational Log 049.ol.2 Summary Subject SCP-049 Preface SCP-049 was provided the corpse of a recently deceased goat. SCP-049 expressed gratitude at the provision. Observation Notes SCP-049 operated on the goat corpse for several days, eventually resulting in an instance of SCP-049-2. SCP-049 expressed pleasure in this outcome, though admitted the disease was still in its nascent stage. My veterinarian practice is rudimentary, but the patient responded well to the procedure. 
Observational Log 049.ol.3 Summary Subject SCP-049 Preface SCP-049 was provided the corpse of a recently deceased orangutan. SCP-049 expressed noted gratitude at the provision due to the similarities between the orangutan and common human physiology. Observation Notes SCP-049 spent several days operating on the orangutan, reanimating it several times. However, SCP-049 appeared to be discontent with the results it experienced, returning to the creature three times after its initial reanimation for additional work. After it was unable to reanimate the corpse a fifth time, SCP-049 turned the corpse over to Foundation staff for incineration, stating, I have learned so much from this. Though I fear my early optimism was misplaced, I hadn't yet come across such a… a stumbling block on my road to the cure. More subjects like this would do a great deal in advancing my research. Observational Log 049.ol.7 Full Subject SCP-049 Preface SCP-049 was provided the corpse of a recently deceased bovine. SCP-049 expressed mild annoyance at the provision, though accepted it nonetheless. SCP-049 had stated its desire to work on human subjects several times between this occasion and the earlier provision of an orangutan, noting its discontentedness when they would not be provided. Observation Notes SCP-049 spent several days operating on the bovine corpse, breaking only to dine on a requested dinner of thin crackers, salted pork, and hard cheese. SCP-049 has expressed that it does not require sustenance, but enjoys it and feels that the food helps to put it in the right mind to operate. Beginning first by embalming the corpse, SCP-049 was observed producing a number of long syringes from its bag, each containing a different dark viscous fluid. SCP-049 described these fluids as essences of the humors and elaborated by saying, the pestilence may bring about a systemic imbalance. In such a case, before true healing can begin, one must find the humors in balance, or the body will reject the cure. SCP-049 added to this statement by saying, This is, of course, elementary knowledge for the practical physician. I would have thought you would have learned this during your education. Over the next few days, SCP-049 spent a considerable amount of time adjusting the organs of the bovine corpse with a number of large metal instruments. After eight days, SCP-049 produced a lightning rod, which Dr. Ham exchanged for an electric cattle prod attached to an extension cord, and struck the corpse in several locations. This action seemingly had the effect of reanimating the bovine, which once again became ambulatory, despite the inversion of the head and reorientation of its limbs. Follow-up interview. Begin log. We've watched you work for several weeks now, and honestly, I'm not sure I understand what you're doing. Could you describe your process in detail? Oh, goodness, no. The process is most intensive. As I said to your assistant, the best instruction you will find about my methods are here in my journals, as I have kept exhaustive records of my work there. I see. Well, my concern, Doctor, is that we still don't understand what you're seeking to cure, or how it manifests, or how turning these creatures into quasi-living, mindless drones helps in that effort. You do not understand the pestilence, even after all this time. Doctor, it is an unspeakable horror, one that has shown its true face many times before, and will again. I find myself blessed with the wisdom and good senses needed to root it out and destroy it. But many, like yourself, cannot. It is a cruel judgment, I fear, to be at the mercy of a disease you cannot fully comprehend. That still doesn't answer my question. How's your cure any kind of cure at all? It is a cure. You may laugh at my efforts if you please, but do not besmirch the good name of scientific progress that has developed this great mercy. What you short-sightedly see here is a life better than any this creature could have hoped for. 
stricken as it was with the pestilence, this creature is now clean, unable to spread the pestilence, and free from the terror it would have experienced otherwise. This is hardly a creature at all, Doctor. It's not even- Do not jape with me, sir. You and your colleagues are like so many others, unable to look past minor setbacks to see the salvation taking place before your very eyes. Do you wait to remove rotten timbers until the hall collapses on top of you? No. You find them and you pull them out and replace them with those untouched by rot. And most of all, you do not simply mock the structure because it now looks different to you. It is strong. It is free of disease. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to agitate you. I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Yes. Well, do mind your words in the future, Doctor. I am a professional, but even professionals may feel the bite of pride in dealing with criticism of their masterpiece. I will forgive this as an act of good faith between colleagues. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, that will be all. Another test subject on the usual schedule. You know my preference of subjects with more human anatomies. End log. Attending researcher's note. SCP-049 does seem to genuinely want to help other humans, though it has not yet been able to provide a concrete example of what exactly it is trying to save us all from. I have watched it now over several weeks. And while the outcomes do not seem to ever change, SCP-049 continues to claim that it is growing closer to its perfect cure. I think the entity may be more aware of the reality of these outcomes than it would like us to think. Addendum 049.3 04-16-2017 Incident Starting shortly after SCP-049's initial containment, Dr. Ham conducted a number of interviews with the subject regarding its anomalous properties and over time began to note its displeasure with its subjects and the SCP-049-2 instances. This continued for a period of several months, during which SCP-049 never exhibited any aggressive behaviors. On April 16, 2017, as Dr. Ham was entering SCP-049's test chamber to conduct another routine interview, the entity began to grow anxious and asked Dr. Ham if he was feeling well. Following protocol, Dr. Ham reminded SCP-049 that the interview was required, after which the entity became hostile and attacked Dr. Ham, killing him. Due to a lapse in security protocol, and because Dr. Ham did not activate the in-chamber emergency system, Dr. Ham's corpse was not discovered until three hours later, by which point SCP-049 had converted it into an instance of SCP-049-2. In the aftermath of this incident, SCP-049 was interviewed by Dr. Theron Sherman. Interviewer, Dr. Theron Sherman, Site-42. Interviewee, SCP-049. Begin log. I need you to explain yourself. SCP-049, you are being directed to explain your actions and I will remind you that failure to cooperate will result in further restrictions during your containment. My actions do not need to be explained. You killed Raymond Ham, and then butchered him until he- Not dead. No, not, not dead. He is, he is cured. Cured? Cured of what? The pestilence, sir. I had thought you, at least would realize what luck it is. I detected it before. What pestilence? You keep going on and on about this pestilence, but you have not once been able to properly identify this disease. What could you have possibly seen in him today that you had not seen so many times before, that it would be worth his life? He, the pestilence, presents and progresses in unforeseeable fashions, and has a queer way of, of creeping into the unprepared and Call it what you want, Doctor. It was a mercy I did to him. He is cured. He is a vegetable. I... I would not expect you to understand. You and your... your ilk have proven time and time again 
not to be men of science, but men of, of emotion. You cannot appreciate the horrors I've seen. Those many millions who have succumbed to the pestilence and been changed. Your cure cost Ray his life. No, good sir, I have saved it. You will allow this world to slip back into the, the despair of disease and death, ignoring that I have created a miracle. And what disease? What pestilence? He was a healthy man. He was a good doctor. I'm offering it freely to the afflicted. You are not worth this argument, sir. You are short-sighted and foolish. Dr. Ham was sick, and I... I cured him. I am the only one who can do this. My work must continue. There is still so much to learn, so much I've to had do. enough of this. And Consider your allowances be saved. Even you. Welcome no, to containment, you know, 049. Might be saved. We're done here. I can save them all. I can cast down this plague once and for all. I can do this. Only me. I am. I saved him. I saved him. <sighs> Dr. Ham. I am. I cured him. He was sick. I know he was sick. I know he was. And I... You are all sick. But I... I can save you. I can save all of you. Because I... I... am the cure. End log. Addendum 049.4 Post-Incident Report Interview the following interview is an excerpt from the 4-16-17-049 incident report. The interview was conducted by Dr. Elijah Itkin and took place three weeks after the start of the initial investigation. Date 5-7-17 Interviewer Dr. Elijah Itkin Interviewee SCP-049 Begin Log SCP-049 we are conducting this interview to close out our investigation of your actions taken on April 16th that resulted in the death of a staff member. Do you have any comments to make? Only that I look forward to the day when you will allow me to resume my work. I have spent the last few weeks compiling my notes and constructing a new theory for how the pestilence was able to infect someone in such an insidious manner that I nearly couldn't detect it. Have you experienced any remorse for your actions? For the death of Dr. Ham? Ah, yes. Well, the death of a colleague is always regrettable. But in the face of the pestilence, we must be swift, Doctor, and act without hesitation. Dr. Sherman noted in his report that you seemed to be mournful during your initial interview. Mourn? Perhaps. I had not thought that. It is lamentable that a fellow doctor became infected, but the work continues. Regrettable as, as it was, Dr. Ham's death provided important insight. Living human subjects are the only way to proceed forward, I am decided. My cure is of little use on dead flesh, and I have gleaned all I can from your generous supply of corpses. My desires turn towards tending to those still living who suffer from the disease. I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> oh, Doctor. I wouldn't be so sure. End log. Item number. SCP-060. Object Class. Keter. Special Containment Procedures. The grove which contains SCP-060 is currently contained in a series of specially constructed greenhouses at Satellite Site 66-060. Specimens are to be pruned regularly to keep at a manageable size. Personnel are banned from smoking while within 5 kilometers of Satellite Site 66-060. Personnel are to refrain from bringing lighters, matches, tasers, or any other tool readily capable of starting a fire into Satellite Site 66-060. SCP-060 specimens are to be watered twice daily and checked weekly for dead plant matter and saplings. Dead matter and saplings are to be pruned, shedded, and composted properly in the dedicated facility on site. 
afterwards returned to SCP-060's containment chamber. Fragments of SCP-060 may not be moved off-site for any reason without explicit written permission from two or more Level 4 personnel. In the event of a breach by SCP-060 Alpha, personnel are to enter lockdown mode and activate on-site fire suppression systems. Redundant on-site fire suppression systems have been installed throughout the site, including water and chemical retardants, to be utilized in tandem in the event of a containment breach. Portable extinguishers are to be kept available at all times. Containment Chamber 060 Alpha 001 is a dedicated circular containment chamber designed to contain SCP-060 Alpha during testing. This chamber is constructed of concrete with a 2 meter thick asbestos coating with a series of chimneys to allow for ventilation of heat during containment. The walls are fitted with 24 CO2 projectors, evenly spaced at 45 degree angles along the walls and will activate in the presence of temperatures exceeding 200 degrees Celsius. One kilogram of SCP-060 material is to be kept within containment chamber 060 Alpha 001 to be burned in the event of a breach. Description: SCP-060 is a grove of 17 white oak trees, Quercus alba. The grove is spread across approximately 8 acres in rural northeastern Minnesota. A house on the property was demolished during the construction of Satellite Site 66-060 after being combed by Foundation personnel for information regarding SCP-060. When burned, SCP-060 will produce an entity henceforth designated SCP-060-Alpha. SCP-060-Alpha appears to be an animate adult human skeleton, standing approximately 2.3 meters tall and surrounded by bright white flames. SCP-060 Alpha initially burns at a temperature of approximately 1500 degrees Celsius or 2730 degrees Fahrenheit and will attempt to cause as much damage as possible when active. Burning as little as 20 grams of SCP-060 will cause SCP-060 Alpha to appear. Only one instance of SCP-060 Alpha will appear at any time. It is theorized that 060 Alpha is a unique entity. SCP-060 Alpha is extremely dangerous, having proven to be hostile and relatively intelligent. It appears to be a single recurring entity, showing a growing familiarity with Satellite Site 66-060's layout over the course of several manifestations. When given the opportunity, it will throw itself bodily at flammable materials in an effort to cause damage and assault personnel with a focus on grappling and strangulation. Additionally, it has proven capable of running at speeds of up to 80 kilometers an hour or 50 miles per hour in short bursts and leaping approximately 5 meters from a running start. Due to the extreme temperatures produced by 060 Alpha during the initial stages of manifestation, along with its physical capabilities, it is capable of causing large uncontrolled fires and widespread property damage if left unchecked. SCP-060 Alpha appears to intentionally avoid burning instances of SCP-060 when it becomes active. If SCP-060 Alpha is introduced to a high enough volume of water or other flame retardant material over a short amount of time, it will begin to weaken to the point that it will collapse into dust. Collapse will occur suddenly with little warning. SCP-060 Alpha will continue to pose a threat up until its collapse. The volume of suppressive material required to subdue SCP-060 Alpha is markedly less than would be expected to quench a heat source of its intensity, with volumes of approximately 500 liters proving sufficient. Areas burned by SCP-060 Alpha will begin to yield sapling instances of SCP-060 over the following four to six weeks. Only one wave of sapling growth will follow any given containment breach. Said saplings are easily pulled and should be composted and supplied to SCP-060's normal containment chambers. Additional information. The property containing SCP-060 contained a burned-out, secluded house upon Foundation acquisition. According to civilian sources, the house's previous owner was a Jonathan Corhill, who was reported to have been a somewhat solitary eccentric, with a tendency towards bitterness and nihilism. Mr. Corhill was reported as a missing person in late 1996 several months after having suddenly cut off all ties to family members and friends. The last person to have had contact with Jonathan Corhill was his brother Christopher, via a telephone call. According to his brother, Corhill had developed an interest in the study of Victorian-era occultism. Furthermore, 
He reported that Jonathan Corhill had seemed normal up until the phone call, at which point he told Christopher never to contact him again. Later in the year, a mail carrier visited the home to deliver a notice of foreclosure, finding it instead as a burned-out shell. Examination showed that the fire began in the living room in the general vicinity of the fireplace. It is now assumed that SCP-060 Alpha manifested within the house while Corhill burned SCP-060 in the fireplace. Considering SCP-060 Alpha's nature, why the house was not entirely destroyed during this alleged manifestation is as of yet unknown. No human remains were found within the structure. Jonathan Corhill's whereabouts, and whether he is dead or alive, are currently unknown. Item Number SCP-065 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures as SCP-065 cannot be moved, it has been contained on site, and site has been established around it. Said site has been marked as a government research facility, off-limits to civilians, and unauthorized individuals attempting to gain access to the area are to be detained, questioned, and administered a Class A amnestic if deemed necessary by site security. An area 17 meters in radius around the center of SCP-065 has been designated the Red Zone. Personnel may not enter the red zone of SCP-065 at any time, and experimentation with SCP-065 may only be performed with prior approval from at least two Level 3 senior research staff. Personnel at high risk of cancer must not be assigned to site and all site personnel must undergo mandatory monthly physical evaluations, including cancer screenings. Description SCP-065 is a spherical region of space approximately 12 meters in radius, located on a farm near an undisclosed location. SCP-065 was formed by the destruction of an anomalous artifact on site by the Global Occult Coalition. Immediately following this initial event, the radius of SCP-065 was estimated to have initially expanded to 108 meters in radius, resulting in the deaths of 11 GOC operatives and 5 civilians. Since containment by the Foundation, the effective radius of SCP-065 has shrunk to and remained stable at its current size. SCP-065 causes abnormal transfiguration of any living organism within its area of effect. These effects include but are not limited to Regression of specialized cells to an undifferentiated stem state Spontaneous separation and fusion of undifferentiated cells Spontaneous necrosis of living tissue and reanimation of dead tissue Rapid genetic mutation of living tissue. These effects occur at a rate proportional to the mass and complexity of the organism. Plants and insects show few, if any, effects. Small animals will exhibit alterations following several days of exposure. Larger animals will show harmful mutations within hours. And all human subjects exposed to the red zone have been fatally altered within approximately 15 minutes of exposure. To date, all attempts at directly observing the center of SCP-065 have failed, as SCP-065 causes a form of extreme sensory confusion in all observers that extends to recording equipment. Affected personnel have reported highly distorted vision and hearing that persists for several hours and can result in severe dizziness and nausea. Addendum 065-1 Researcher Note on a robotic rover designed to use somatosensory rather than visual or acoustic navigation managed to reach the center of SCP-065 and retrieve several objects. When pieced back together, these objects appeared to be the shattered fragments of a stone figurine of Cocopelli, a Native American fertility deity. Along with pre-incident data obtained from the Global Occult Coalition, it appears that this artifact has been used by the civilian family to boost the yield of their farm and only came to the attention of the GOC when an investigation by the United States Department of Agriculture revealed genetic markers in their supposed organic crops, consistent with those of genetically modified organism, or GMO, crops. The GOC attempted an on-site destruction of this artifact, resulting in the creation of SCP-065. Following this incident, the GOC contacted a Foundation liaison and requested assistance in containing the resultant anomaly. Dr. Addendum 065-2 The following document was recovered from the formerly civilian-owned farmhouse at Site- John, I heard things aren't going so well back at home. I wish I could come back and help right now, 
but it's tough over here right now as well, and we're on the verge of some important discoveries. I know it's not much, but I found this during the trip. The man who gave it to me described it as a representation of that which is and that which might be, planted by the cornfield, and hopefully it will help make ends meet. See you soon. G. Item number SCP-139 Containment Class Eparch Disruption Class Dark Special Containment Procedures Containment Suspended Description SCP-139 designates the disappearance of Lucian Sachs, formerly a Foundation-employed security specialist. Sachs had, until SCP-139's occurrence, acted as a consultant for Site-97 on the matter of esoteric reanimation methodology. SCP-139 is considered anomalous, both due to a persistent info hazard encountered following its occurrence, and due to the cutoff of information pertaining to SCP-139 after April 4, 1978. Despite Site-97's best efforts, neither Sachs's past or present whereabouts, nor the location of a cadaver, have been uncovered. Extra-dimensional travel is suspected, but not confirmed. No primary suspects which could be responsible for SCP-139 have been identified, owing to the largely inconclusive results of investigative efforts. As such, SCP-139 is currently considered a cold case and is expected to continue indefinitely. Timeline of Events March 5, 1978 Sachs clocks in at Site-97 and declines usual chatter with personnel at the front entrance. He enters his office and does not exit for the remainder of the workday. For a period of 12 hours, Sachs queries 42 skipnet entries pertaining to thaumaturgic workings, global leyline activity, and available research into way and knock techniques. This idle activity contradicts his otherwise exemplary productivity record and raises concern among Site-97 staff. Sensor agents are dispatched appropriately. No further abnormalities occur until Sachs has punched out and arrived at his residence in suburban Albany. By 10.45 p.m., he vacates his residence, presumably on foot to avoid detection, and exits the city limits. March 6th A paper trail of bus and train tickets suggests he traveled approximately 2,000 kilometers to Topeka, Kansas, arriving at 12.15 p.m. Of note, interviewed civilians occasionally described Sachs as that damn traitor when recounting this 18-hour period. March 7th to April 4th. After Topeka, the paper trail terminates, and reports of Sachs's location during the following month become increasingly irregular. A car he is believed to have rented is sighted in Salt Lake City, Utah, and Lubbock, Texas, on March 10th and March 15th, respectively, although the windshield and rightmost taillight shattered between the two cities. He is last documented in Tucson, Arizona, after residential police implicate him in a resistant flea incident on suspicions of vagrancy. Note, this police report was filed on April 3rd at 3.48 a.m. and is considered the last documented sighting of Lucien Sachs by the public. On April 4th, sensor agents embedded within the Tucson USPS removed the following letter from the mail pool. To the ones I'm running from, I hate you. I hate what you've done and what you're doing to me and what I think you did to the others who ran. I hate how I'd find lenses in the eyes of paintings and strange fingerprints on my belongings. I'm curious by trade, but you've really got me beat. I'm not the first to run, but I might be the first to break free. I'm going someplace without cameras or fingerprints, someplace you can't follow. It was fun while it lasted, but you lost this one. And soon I'll be back, and you're going to lose more. The hand has always been welcoming to people like me anyways. Addendum 139-1 SCP-137 officially concluded on April 27, 1993, when a minor structural failure revealed a small air pocket within Site-97's concrete foundation. Although this led to a temporary lockdown due to the destruction of Site-97's courtyard, integrity was eventually restored. Models of the air pocket prior to the structural failure indicate it resembled a prostrate human body fitting Lucian Sachs's height and build. After the initial excavation, the following personal effects were discovered. The necrotic flesh of a heavily decayed human cadaver, and several human bones. 
most pulverized by the aforementioned structural failure. A foundation keycard for a Site-97 security specialist. ID number scratched out, suggesting deep shame. A forbidden thaumaturgic ritual to preserve its user's spirit after their death. A map of ley line positionings in the contiguous United States, often referenced by enemies of the Foundation. A circle had been drawn around a nexus on the U.S.-Mexico border near Tucson, Arizona. Sachs's cause of death is believed to be terminal dehydration, following several days of entombment. During the investigation of this air pocket, Site-97 excavators punctured a secondary cutout hidden within the concrete due to the considerable strain that excavation would put on Site-97's foundation. This cutout has not been analyzed extensively. What can be determined, however, is that it contains a large number of partially decomposed human eyes, believed to exceed 1,000 in total. Perforations within the concrete would have allowed these eyes to observe their target on all sides until he expired. Archived Containment Procedures SCP-139 Omega is presently being tracked, observed, and hounded by Site-97 deep cover personnel. Via unanimous O5 vote, the Tucson Leyline Bridge has been rerouted to Site-97's foundation for the interim. Update. Greater containment effectuated. Protocol. All eyes on Lucian rescinded. Project Loose Ends in progress. Site-97's full capabilities have been directed towards the neutralization of SCP-139 Omega who remains at large post-mortem via knowledge it has stolen from Site-97. Following a breach of its containment area beneath Site-97, SCP-139 Omega has demonstrated robust mobility and incorporeality, rendering it difficult to track and recontain. Fortunately, it has a habit of sticking its nose in places it does not belong. Note. Ethics Committee review of SCP-139 Omega's containment procedures have generated unanimous approval. Overwatch Command is in agreement. SCP-139 Omega's crimes are many and unforgivable. Site-97 took SCP-139 Omega in. They provided it with safety, community, and purpose. And it has shunned all of those. This is why on the other side of that way, it found nothing but concrete damnation and the all-seeing eye. Item Number SCP-156 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-156 is to be kept in Refrigerated Storage Unit 19C, except when removed for experimentation. Subjects infected by SCP-156 are to be restrained and monitored for their own safety. From September 21st to March 21st, infected subjects should be kept within a secure storage unit, unless the experiment's parameters indicate otherwise. Both storage facilities should be monitored by security camera. The termination and autopsy of D-Class personnel assigned to SCP-156 should be delayed until after March 21st. No personnel are permitted to consume SCP-156, except D-Class personnel, unless approved by a Level 3 staff member. Description SCP-156 is a group of exactly 181 pomegranate arrows. The number of instances of SCP-156 is constant. When one is ingested or destroyed, it is replaced instantaneously with a new one, among the largest group of contiguous instances. Otherwise, the instances can be moved around freely. After leaving the group, i.e. after an instance is touching no other instance, the instance will spoil normally, after which a new instance will appear. When all instances are destroyed simultaneously, all 181 instances reappear randomly at the location of one of the destroyed arrows. Attempts to measure the time between destruction of one instance and the appearance of a new one using high-speed cameras have so far failed. If SCP-156 is ingested between March 21st and September 20th, subjects display no signs of infection until noon of September 21st, when all vital processes abruptly cease. A similar effect is observed immediately when SCP-156 is ingested after September 21st. Despite being technically dead, post-mortem examinations of subjects have been unable to discover a cause of death. Subjects appear to have been in perfect health, aside from any pre-existing conditions. While dead, subjects do not show any signs of decomposition, 
though the bodies of many subjects begin displaying bruising and scarring consistent with torture. While the majority of subjects suffer these wounds, not all do, and no reliable formula has been discovered to predict which subjects will be affected. Infected subjects remain in this dormant state until noon of March 21st, when life processes restart. Subjects remember little of the intervening time period. While most subjects are entirely unaware that any time has passed since their apparent death, some claim to recall a pale white male face and a wilting pomegranate tree. Subjects continue to die and reanimate annually on September and March 21st respectively, until killed by another cause. Reanimation only occurs from deaths caused by ingesting SCP-156. After undergoing a single death reanimation cycle, subjects begin displaying high levels of distress and paranoia as time approaches September 21st, even if they have not been made aware of the death reanimation cycle. Furthermore, subjects will take extreme lengths to avoid taking any sort of risk or danger to their person, even if they had displayed risk-taking behaviors prior to ingesting SCP-156. Over the course of multiple death reanimation cycles, these psychological symptoms become more pronounced. At the same time, physical symptoms during the dormant period increase in intensity for the subjects suffering from them. Eventually, physical wounds on subjects will begin to emulate burns and puncture wounds. Many subjects gain a phobia of dogs and dead plants after three to five reanimations. After several deaths caused by SCP-156, the ocular tissue undergrows necrosis in many subjects. This tissue does not reanimate with the rest of the body. Often, after ten or more reanimations, reanimation of bodily processes will occur, but the subject will fail to regain consciousness, entering a comatose state. Death and reanimation continues annually, even after subjects have reached this stage. SCP-156 came to the attention of the Foundation after an incident in Greece. After several people died on September 21st, 19 without apparent cause. The Foundation became involved after locals reported the return of several of the dead, who had been interred in above-ground vaults the following spring. After questioning these subjects, all reported having attended a party at the house of one A.K., who had been buried and was found asphyxiated in her coffin. SCP-156 was discovered within the house, fresh, despite the intervening six months since the incident. Testing commenced on D-Class personnel. D-E15624, the first test subject, died in September and was autopsied. No cause of death could be found. Subject was left under monitoring and storage. In March of the same year, subject began to show brain activity and subject's heart began beating, despite the body having taken significant damage during the autopsy. D-E15624 expired shortly thereafter, without regaining consciousness. Errol's given SCP status, and longer-term testing was ordered. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now, and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.